Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the third seminar in the series Internationalization at Home on Higher Education. Um, very proud and pleased to announce our first foreign speaker, yeah. foreign in a different sense than we had uh, the first time and the second time. Uh, Pedro Chichera is the director of the Center for Research on Higher Education Policy at Porto, and he's also uh, an associate professor at the Faculty of Economics at the University of Porto. It's great to have you here, and I think you're exactly the right person to talk about this topic. So, without much further ado, we'll see. Yeah, we'll check <laughs> you yeah, afterwards. No, no, but the floor is yours, uh, Pedro. Thank, Thank you very you much. much. Thank you, Jeroen. And um, particularly, I'm particularly grateful that you come on a Friday afternoon to this, especially at four o'clock, which is rather when you start. As an economist, I would say the opportunity cost of listening to a seminar <laughs> increases significantly, but. Um, I just hope that you won't find by the end of the, the seminar that your time was completely wasted. Um, I'm also not sure that I'm the best person to talk about this because, as you know, economists have a particular way of looking into these things. And, and what I'm doing this, I, I was discussing this with Irun beforehand, that I'm, I'm trying to do something that combines two of my um, intellectual interests. On the one hand, Yes, I'm an economist, and I'm interested in analyzing some of these issues um, related to higher education from an economic point of view. But I'm also interested in, I've, I've been doing some work, actually, I started my academic career as an historian of ideas and historian of economic ideas. And I'm, I'm interested also in understanding how certain ideas, particularly economic ideas, have become influential in terms of political debates and in terms of particularly in higher education policy debates. So wh what I'm doing here is, in a sense, doing two for the price of one. So you get the, the, the first part is, in a sense, trying to give you um, the intellectual pedigree of some of the ideas and some of the ways that I think dominate nowadays the economic views about higher education. And, um, and then I will just highlight dimensions in which this influence has been uh, playing a, a, an increasing role over the last decades. And I hope that you, um, I think, I think can be the first part, although in a sense an intellectual deviation, I think can be useful for you to know who are the, the, the suspects for some of the, the growing influence of certain economic ideas on higher education. And the, the way this change these views about how much our public or our private is higher education and in what sense. Okay, feel free to interrupt me uh, whenever there's something that's not clear or you just want to make a comment or question so um, we can go, I mean, especially with these uh, numbers, I think we can go fairly uh, informally and some of you already know me for quite some time so we can uh, move on. Okay. Um, so the first part I want to do is about how certain economic ideas have been, how it's been the, well, the economic thinking about higher education in particular, but education in general, hasn't been stable. And although I will do this as sort of in a snapshot, we'll cover more than 200 years, which is um, not sort of, uh, it shows that I'm an economist, not an historian, otherwise we wouldn't do it. Um, but it's really... Um, I think it's also interesting because it challenged something that nowadays is very um, dominant in the self-perception but also in the perception that if people have about economics that things are totally scientific in a way that they are not, cannot be discussed. And I think one of the things that shows by looking at the way economic ideas about anything but particularly about education have changed, it shows that in a sense they are also a product of a certain political, social, historical context. So that we should also be open to discuss them and to understand them embedded in a certain context and not accept them that this kind of revealed truth that has been uh, uh, inspired by a, a divine or non-divine divine, uh, source. And, of course, whenever you talk about economics, you need to start with the, 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 the main suspect is, of course, Adam Smith. You, you, I, I assume that probably all of you have heard about him. And um, economics, in a sense, is also very peculiar that I think then another, many other of the sciences and, and even many other social sciences, because of this um, canonical view about the way the discipline and about the science has developed and about ideas have developed. And, 
And in many ways, it's, I think it happens um, for various reasons, most of them, I think, very often rhetorical uh, or argumentative reasons. Um, people claim that the Founding Fathers already talked about this, so therefore this is an important idea, this is a valid idea. And very often you have competing claims about what really Adam Smith said, or what John Stuart Mill or Alfred Marshall, and, and a lot of the, the debates about the discipline are very much the sort of these, um, I can't remember the word in English, but you, you remember when you were a child that you had these sort of uh, um, small books that you, can, you could buy, the, um, I, how are they called, uh, these things that you, you just glue them, and you, the stickers with sort of faces, maybe it would be the, the sort of the football players or the other thing. And, and, and very often you have this, it's like you have the, all the, the sort of the aristocratic families that have the, 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 print, the, the paintings in the room, the main room with the, sort of the, the main, the illustrious members of the family. And, and in economics this is, I think, very much used very often as an argument of authority to win an argument uh, whenever you have even a contemporary debate. And I think that's, that's peculiar and that plays very often uh, also an ideological role um, and it's Adam Smith that actually is particularly complicated because it is very difficult to interpret, and in many ways he is not very straightforward about what he wanted uh, to say. And that, on the one that that created a, an industry in itself, so a lot of people had made a living over the years by interpreting and studying Smith's work, but uh, it also means that people can use Smith to claim very different things. But one of the things that I think he, Adam Smith has been very much used is about the emphasis of market and market system. And it's normally associated with the idea that, um, well, um, if a society, well, is most uh, well-known uh, work, of course, is the uh, wealth of nations. And a lot of that is trying to understand what is the best system, what's the best economic system in order to maximize wealth, individual wealth and the wealth of uh, a society, a community. And one of the, the important things when it comes to education is that actually it doesn't make a significant difference between education and many other things. So in a sense, for in, in simplified terms, for Adam Smith, if, it, if the ideas of competition, private property, um, liberty are good for most sectors, they're also good for education. And, and that will create, from the beginning, a very strong bias among um, economic thinkers that, in a sense, education should be organized according to market principles. And this, this kind of argument will be very, very important, particularly in the later part of the 20th century with revival of neoliberal ideas, and that's very uh, significant. The other thing in which Smith is, is very important, and, and Smith actually has, has um, a very critical view about, um, well, Public universities is a, is a difficult concept in the in the, the British uh, case, but the, the the established universities, the old universities, and he has some very nasty comments about uh, Oxford, uh, about his visits. He was professor at Glasgow, uh, one of the oldest Scottish universities, and he has this very um, and one of the, uh, the 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 most critical remarks is the one that I've listed here uh, towards the end of the Wealth of Nations that. But he says those parts of education is to be observed for the teaching of which there are no public institutions are generally the best parts. So his idea that in public institutions, because people have their salaries guaranteed, they will tend to be lazy, they will not care about their students, and therefore, in order to have good quality education, you need to have competition, you need to have that the, the, the salaries of the professors are paid by the students, so that they will be responsive to the students, and the students can be more demanding. And that's something that nowadays, if you would propose, it would be regarded as sort of very uh, libertarian view about education. Um, uh, although there, there are some people, I think, that would endorse this view, um, but uh, I suspect not the sort of the dominant view. The other thing in which Smith is also important, and I, I, I was about to say before, and now I, I say it now, um, is an idea that at the time I don't think will have a major impact, but then will play a very significant role in the second half of the 20th century, which is the use of the metaphor human capital. The idea that you can treat educated people as a kind of machine, an expensive machine, that has to be built and developed because you, and you need to spend time in terms of training that person, and therefore 
that person will be more productive and at the same time will expect a higher income. Okay? And that is an idea that is in many ways very uh, significant in Smith, but then will more or less fade away during most of the 19th century and even a lot of the 20th century. But then once it will be revived, it will become a very, very important idea, both in economics, but also, I think, about the way economists, and even nowadays non-economists, think about higher education. Okay. These are the sort of the two um, ideas that I would emphasize. I mean, there's far more there, but I, I think these two are, are important. The second sticker on your collection would be um, John Stuart Mill. And John Stuart Mill, of course, was not only an economist and is important in many ways as a philosopher, as a political scientist and thinker. And one of the things in which, um, I mean, John Stuart Mill, again, is a difficult um, character to be understood because he lives in, in a tension, a tension between, on the one hand, he wants to be part of this tradition that very much started with Adam Smith at the end of the 18th century, that we normally call classical political economy, the idea that basically you should organize the economic activities according to principles of market, competition, private property, that the state should not interfere too much, the sort of the liberal state of the 19th century. But at the same time, he lives in a world that is very different from the one that Smith lived. So in Smith, there was a lot of um, uh, optimism and in a sense, a lot of promise that capitalism and the market economy would bring wealth for everyone and would bring a more harmonious society. And the idea, as you know, for those that are familiar with 18th century thought, the sort of the idea of stability and the natural order, these are a very important ideas for 18th century um, um, enlightenment. Whereas when he's writing, uh, uh, when John Stuart Mill is writing in the, 19th, in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, the, the, the environment is much more complicated. You have, of course, socialism is, is on the rise, and the idea is that actually that a capitalist, market capitalist society can deliver uh, not only efficiency but also equity is very much challenged by um, many people on the left, and therefore he tries to combine the two things, that on the one hand you can have um, you almost can have the cake it and eat it. So you can have a sort of efficiency and production growing, and at the same time you can have redistribution and more uh, a more egalitarian society. And one of the things that, that will play into that attempt to compromise and to make more palatable for his contemporaries the idea of an, a liberal state is actually education. And, and that's what I call um, the emergence of paternalism, because... What John Stuart Mill is trying to combine is at the same time saying, yes, we should keep um, a society in which a lot of the duties of education are privately run, so most of the education system is still privately run, but, um, and that's why, for instance, he, he criticized the idea of a, a, a state system of education, and that's the, the quotation that I selected. An education established and controlled by the state should only exist, if it exists at all, as one among many competing experiments. Carried on for the purpose of example and stimulus to keep the others up to a certain standard of excellence, unless indeed when society in general is in so backward a state that it could not or would not provide for itself any proper institutions of education unless the government undertook the task. And there are several interesting ideas there. I, I would just highlight two or three things that I think are important. One is that the idea that to have a state, to have a public system is not necessarily to have a state system. And I think that's, that's an idea that is very significant for the, the British context, but is not, that's an idea that is in some ways confusing for the continental context, because for most continental European countries to have a public system is to have a state system. And, and that is, that is, I think, an interesting uh, difference, and it's an interesting difference that plays nowadays into not so much into higher education, but in non-higher education. And when you see the movement, for instance, of charter schools and the, the, the possibility of having public funding going to private, privately run um, uh, schools, it is this idea increasingly. And, and it is an important idea because a lot of the economic uh, reasoning about education and higher education in contemporary is by separating the funding of education and the provision of education. So you don't need, in order to have a publicly funded system, you don't have to uh, have a system that is provided by public institutions. And that's, and I think that's um, an important issue in terms of 
where to draw the line between publicness and privateness and the change in borders between publicness and privateness. The other thing that is, I think is also interesting is again this idea that you need competition in order to have quality of education. And that's something that um, I think non-economists would necessarily, certainly educationalists would, would question, but it's something that became very much embedded into um, economist beliefs, that idea that competition by itself is a very good thing and because it, it enhances people's capabilities and enforces institutions to be more effective and more efficient the way they use resources and the way they deliver education. And, and the third thing that is also interesting is, and that's why I think he starts opening the door for paternalism, um, it's because he's starting to be concerned with the standards of those privately, with the dominant private sector in education. And the idea that, well, maybe they should, they could provide the quantity of education needed, but they will not provide probably the quality of education. And actually this is a, a big debate um, at that time in terms of uh, if the government, there are two things there. One is the definition of compulsory education. Uh, and the second one is how much the government should interfere with private institutions. And this is, again, something that uh, questions and, and brings the debate about where do you draw the line between what are the public responsibilities and the public duties? Um, should the government be uh, responsive, uh, responsible for um, checking the quality of public and private institutions and what kind of instruments and what kind of uh, um, power should the government have to interfere with, with even public, private institutions? And I think that's, that's one thing that uh, it's, it's significant. And the other thing that is um, significant is that he starts thinking um, that um, the, the, the idea of paternalism and, and in which introduced, I think, an important dimension that will then prove uh, significant in later debates is the idea that um, it's very difficult for people to assess the advantages of education and those that, in a sense, would benefit most from more education will be the least qualified for that. So, I mean, in other words, um, the, the paternalist argument is very much about working class groups, which are, in a sense, the most alienated parts of society, the ones that have benefited less from the, the riches of um, early capitalism. And he says, well, one of way of integrating them into society and providing them better opportunities, especially for their children and grandchildren, is to bring them into the educational system. But at the same time, if you leave that, this to be decided by their parents or grandparents, most likely because they are uneducated, they will not value education as the educated ones. And therefore, um, in a sense, what is opening the door is, although this is privately um, run, this should be compulsory. So the society should impose on every individual to achieve a certain level of education. And it's opening the door, uh, not necessarily for a state system, but increasingly to a public system in which, for instance, the government will pay for some of the costs of education because in order to allow the low-income families to participate and to be better educated and therefore to have other types of opportunities. And there's some interesting things in, in which I, I, I don't have time to go so much into that, but there are some interesting things in terms of curriculum and what he thinks that the... the, the uh, workers should learn, and families from and children from working class families, for instance, in terms of learning classics and literature and so on, because he thinks that they shouldn't learn only technical um, aspects, but they should learn other things that would develop their intellectual capability. Uh, bear in mind that this is important in many ways, in, in ways that maybe for our um, sort of Western, more affluent society is not significant, but it's certainly different in other contexts, which is to learn some of these, um, to have this intellectual development was in many ways a possibility to, to uh, participate politically. And, and it's, again, this was significant in terms of their, inf their social relevance and their social participation and their, their social power. And, and that's, I think, also, and that's why, for instance, John Stuart Mill has a far more sympathetic view towards enlarging political participation and views of democracy which were not very much shared by a lot of these uh, contemporaries. Um, the same thing would go for the education of women, of whom is one of the champions of that time, and, and, you, and again it, it fits into his arguments in, in, in favour of the, 
the rights of women and uh, the participation, the political and social participation of women. The third uh, sort of uh, picture that I, I would um, introduce is the one of Alfred Marshall. And, and Marshall is probably the, the least known of them, but in many ways is more even more significant to the training of economists, because a lot of the, um, I don't know how, how many economists are in the room, one, two, but all of you that had some sort of basic economics, a lot of them is Marshallian um, microeconomics. So the, the graphs of supply and demand, this basic um, economics that you learn, even sort of non-economists that learn some introductory economics, this is very much stabilized by Marshall. And, and to give you some idea, um, although he, he dies in 1924, by the 1950s, 1960s, there were still some graduate schools in the US, for instance, in Chicago. Someone like Friedman would still use Marshall's textbook as an introductory textbook to microeconomics, um, something that a first edition was from the 1880s, 1890s. So it gives you an idea how influential, and, and it's also relevant, I think, in many ways, because some of the... Um, best known names in a discipline are not necessarily the most influential and, and in some ways it also plays into something that I think is relevant, although not necessarily here for, for this discussion, which is the role of textbooks in shaping the views of generations of students in a certain discipline. And, and Marshall was very, very influential in that respect. And Marshall was in a sense the standard view in economics for most of the first half of the uh, uh, 20th century. And, and one of the things, and he was very much respected by his view as sort of the technical expertise. And actually Marshall is responsible for something that in many ways is at the origin of something that you don't like about economics, which is when economics moves from political economy into economics. The idea that, no, we want to be a science, we want to be recognized as science, and not as just as, as a political discourse, as a discourse that is constructive, to influence political ideas and political decisions. And it's, this is really the, the beginning of a process that will go on, certainly in the 1940s and the 1950s, in which um, economics becomes increasingly more abstract and theoretical, and wants to show that we are different from the other social science. In some, way, in some cases, we, we don't even want to be regarded as social science, because our model is much more physics, rather than in it's a kind of social physics. And yes, the non-economists will normally smile at this, but uh, we also will smile at this. But this was very, very influential in the way economics is, is um, developed throughout most of the 20th century, and, and still is. And one of the things of that, this technicality is to start to look increasingly into how these markets operate, and how, what, in, in which situations the market framework will be less effective than was anticipated. And he will introduce one concept that is very important in the case of education, is, which is the issue of market failure. So in a sense, what, what Marshall tries to identify is a situation in which, because of specificities of that good or that sector, or the agents involved in that sector, uh, for instance, insufficient information, um, that means, or the type of the characteristics of that good, that means that the market system doesn't work as well as you would anticipate. So if you start putting together Stuart Mill saying, well, in some ways we should make some compromise in education because education is relevant not only from an economic point of view but also politically and socially. And at the same time, you start saying, well, there are certain sectors where the market framework actually, we can show this technically, scientifically, that doesn't work very well. Then you start having a kind of argument to justify that the state actually should play a much more significant role in education, and that education in general, and higher education in particular, should be much more regulated than people would think about, think, um, um, 70, 80, 100 years before. And one of the things that um, is interesting, and uh, Marshall in, in also is, is responsible for delaying the emergence of this view of human capital and the education as a kind of human capital, because Although he uses that expression, he says, oh, this is not very realistic. This is too abstract. And although Smith used this, and although other economists, actually some of these contemporaries, like Evan Fisher, the, which was very important in the development of theory of capital, 
um, an American economist of the late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, and he says, well, although this was relevant um, as, a, as a theoretical concept, then you cannot operate this and you cannot operationalize. Uh, and part of the problem, he says, well, because the way people, the way parents behave when they educate their children is not really an, under basically an economic motivation. So they don't look at their children as, as an investment as you look at money in the bank or an investment that you put in the, um, um, in a company and so on and so forth. And therefore, that means that you cannot treat education exactly in the same way that you treat other kinds of economic decisions. And that opens, again, the, the issues like um, market imperfections in terms of funding. How can we fund education? Because you cannot necessarily operate this through a market system. And again, this will start creating more and more the, the arguments in favor of a stronger political public involvement and less sort of the market regulation of the, of the education system. And actually one of the things that he will um, emphasize even further is this argument you had already in, um, in John Stuart Mill is that in a sense if you don't do something in terms of growing public intervention, growing public subsidization of education, then education becomes very much a mechanism of social reproduction. So those that have, are wealthier and more educated, of course, will value education and will take their children up to the maximum they can. And these, because they are more qualified, will get access to the better professions and the best paid professions in any given, at any given moment. And whereas the other ones, the uneducated ones or the ones that are least educated, will tend to value this because they have less information about the benefits and therefore, this will create basically what um, in sociology you call social reproduction. And therefore, therefore, if you want to break this, if you want to create a more meritocratic society, then it's worthwhile spending more money. So on the one hand, you have, let's say, the, the political argument, the social argument, and the other hand, you have starting having the technical argument about market failures and the fact that you can justify on certain grounds that a market system doesn't necessarily work well in some conditions. And then you get Dr. Evil, uh, for some people, that, well, this will actually, will provide a lot of the arguments, and then, as you know, you know, just briefly, you know the story, well, certainly, in the 19, from the 1930s onwards, and with the Great Depression, there's a growing involvement and growing interference of the state. You have that at the macro level, but you also have at the micro level, and you have growing regulation, for instance, of the labor market, you have growing uh, unionization and growing strength of unions in many countries, certainly in Western Europe and, and North America. And therefore, when you get to the 1960s, in many cases you talk about the sort of uh, a mixed economy. So you don't talk anymore about the sort of uh, a market capitalist economy in many cases because you have a combination of strong public interference with private property. And, well, you have all the debates in in continu continental Europe about the social market economy, which again is an attempt to moderate competition, private property, uh, for the sake of equality, redistribution, and so on and so forth. And the tide will start to change, uh, I think largely associated with um, this gentleman that you probably know, at least you've heard about him. And, and freedom in, in many ways is, is, I think, is far more interesting than the caricature that we normally, both the advocates and the enemies, will play about him. And one of the things that I think is interesting is because I think he truly believed in democracy. I know that for someone that's normally associated with collaborating with dictatorships, it's probably not the best um, definition, but I think he was in a sense that he felt that in order to that his ideas would uh, have an influence, he would have to convince the majority of his um, uh, the people surrounding him. And, and that's why I think Differently from many other economists, Friedman was very much a public intellectual. And he was interested in, and that's why he was so active in uh, public policy debates, in writing for newspapers. Um, whenever I give a class about Friedman as a public intellectual, I will even show uh, samples of the interview that he gave to the magazine Playboy. Um, so this gives you in a sense of how large audience he wanted to reach. Um, and it's certainly the less predictable, especially if you're talking to bachelor students, it's always, it always makes a sort of an impact that economists can be interviewed by Playboy um, with no pictures. Um, and um, damn it. 
Um, and uh, but it, uh, but I think it's, it's it's very very interesting about and actually if you remember for those of you that remember the debate in the 1970s, you had actually Friedman on one side being the advocate of um, um, free economics and market economics, and Galbraith on the other hand trying to sort of uh, advocate much more sort of continuation of Keynesian policies and 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 strong uh, government influence. And the the other thing that is I think very interesting is that he is really, really stubborn in terms of his ideas. So for most of his early part, he was very much lonely in terms of his arguments and in terms of um, his positions. And and I think he was very successful in terms of changing the tide. Um, and part of that is because he was really committed to uh, influence people. And there are some um, reports about, for instance, the fact that, for instance, Mrs. T., for those that know uh, Margaret Thatcher was not particularly um, excited and 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 um, um, impressed when she met uh, Hayek, the Austrian economist that was very much sort of a, a very important figure in fighting against Keynesianism from the 1930s onwards. But she was terribly impressed with Friedman, and uh, because apparently he was re really persuasive, and he he knew how to change. The, 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 the type of arguments, the tone of the arguments when you're talking to an intellectual or to an academic audience or when you were talking mainly to an audience of politicians. And you see that actually when you compare his writings in terms of his more academic work, more sort of uh, academic oriented work and his more political work, you, you see that he was very skillful in terms of adjusting that. And that, and that I think it's, it's significant. Of course, Friedman is known for one of uh, the, the, the pieces that is best known is a small book called um, Capitalism Freedom from 1962, which in some ways, in the case of education actually, um, you develops arguments that he had already um, published in 1955 in, in a chapter in, in the book in honor, a fast script in honor of another colleague. And, and basically what he does in that uh, small book is trying to use this idea of capitalism, freedom, markets, to areas of social activity in which he thinks that the government has gone too far. And one of them is precisely education. And actually, he, he tends to put the emphasis very much on this idea that you need to separate public education from state education. So he actually doesn't question so much, and this is something that normally the neoliberals don't say, um, he doesn't question so much the public subsidies to education, especially to basic education, what he questions is the provision of um, education by a, say, a state system. So what, is, what he goes back is to recover the, the Smithian argument that competition is also good for education, which is something that nowadays we listen again and again. And that's part, of, I think, of the, the most important. And he uses a word that is, is I think, particularly uh, interesting for the discussion today, is uh, the nationalization of education, this idea, well, against privatization, so that the society and the government has nationalized like they have done with other sectors, they have nationalized education, and there's no really argument, because he says, well, there is no uh, technical economic argument to justify why this should be nationalized as uh, you know, like a, a natural monopoly or situation where you would, you would need to do this. And, um, and then you, you find the, sort of the, the, the standard argument that nowadays you recognize about in favor of uh, competition, and efficiency, and how too much interference and too much regulation has hindered the capacity of uh, institutions to respond to adapt, to be more flexible, to respond to uh, so, uh, so, uh, society's needs and to students' demand. The kind of arguments are, they, I think are very much um, um, repeated in a lot of debates about markets and competition in, in higher education in general. The final sort of... Um, um, Stickers, and now you get three for the price of one. Um, are the three the trio that is associated, um, in many ways less, in some ways that may sound a little bit different from the sort of the political arguments that we've been presenting um, and discussing, but I think they are influential in 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 significant ways, and that fits in some ways with the Friedman argument. So in a sense, what Friedman opens is the again, the possibility of redressing government intervention and changing again the, the trend towards great emphasis on market forces and privatization and competition. 
And what these three gentlemen, um, I don't, you probably, the best known normally is, is Becker, uh, because he's also very more uh, visible and he also has, is more controversial because of his applications of um, economic theory, especially neoclassical economics to social uh, non-market behavior. Um, these two were Nobel Prize winners, actually, to things related to precisely this concept that I'm I'm highlighting there, which is the human the idea of human capital. So this idea that goes back to Adam Smith, uh, that was then more or less disappeared, uh, and then that was revived from the 1960s onwards. And um, these three gentlemen, they were interested in 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 different ways, uh, or they had different motivations in exploring this idea. I will not um, get too much into detail. Um, I will just highlight actually that in some ways, if, you, if you're interested in these intellectual connections, both Beck and Schultz were at Chicago most of their careers. Actually, um, Schultz was the, head of, the longest serving head of the department from 1946 to 1961. So, and he, he stayed in the department for many, many years and Beck is still active, although he's now already, of course, um, um, sort of technically retired. That is still around, and, and he was actually a student of Friedman. So, uh, in a sense, this is part of a network. So, it's the, the combination of the two ideas is not um, really uh, sort of uh, an accident. Um, and uh, Mincer is slightly different. Mincer was trained at Columbia. He actually spent some time in Chicago, um, and then he spent a lot of years at Columbia back working with uh, Gary Becker, and they actually trained. Most of the, the, the first economists working in, on human capital topics from the late 1960s onwards, most all of them were either trained by Schultz at Chicago or by the two of them in, at Columbia. So they are really, really the, the sort of the, the trio that will start this field of research. Why is this relevant for um, what we are discussing about privatization and marketization? Because I think they are very important in increasingly looking at education as a kind of human capital. And by doing this, they, they turn higher education increasingly as an investment. They don't say that education is only that, but uh, they will emphasize this. And they will emphasize that both from an individual point of view and from a social point of view, because you look at this as an investment, you want, as any kind of um, economic agent, you want to maximize your return. And if you want to maximize your return, so you'll do a cost-benefit analysis, you look at what are the individual costs and the um, uh, individual benefits. You look at the social costs and the social benefits, and you adjust and you try to adjust, for instance, the funding according to this. At the same time, um, so the the argument about who benefits and who should pay, all the argument about the economic returns of higher education and that that you show well consistently, the private returns, individual returns are much higher than the public ones. Therefore we should readjust the funding structure in order to reflect that. And I think they are also, although they haven't worked so much on this, I think they played an important role in, in this, then the following step, which is, well, if you start looking at higher education from an economic point of view, as an economic decision, as an economic investment, then you need to reorganize that sector in a way that maximizes the individual and the social return. So you need to rethink the way higher education institutions operate in a way that they should be compatible with this maximization that both individuals and societies want to make. So I think, although I, it was not necessarily uh, planned, and although I, I don't think it was their initial major concern, because they were more interested in terms of the labor market and the, the returns in the labor market, I think this argument had played an important role backwards by saying, well, if we want our graduates to do as best as they can in the future, then we need to rethink the way higher education is organized, what type of higher education is provided, um, who should pay that, and so on and so forth. And the sort of the economization of higher education systems and higher education institutions. And, and because they, they, they made this idea of education as a human capital, as an investment, so popular, not only in economics, but with um, politicians, with international organizations, with um, society at large. I mean, the idea of the expression human capital nowadays is, is very present uh, everywhere. And 
and and this was always a very controversial issue at that time. Um, any of them will will talk, or oh, have, have talked about the resistance both in economics and outside of economics about this. This was always regarded as a double-sided sword, even within economics. Because on the one hand, yes, you would provide an additional argument to justify why it was important for society to spend and for individuals to spend money in higher education. But at the same time, it placed all the emphasis on the economic arguments and the economic benefits of uh, higher education. And it really played down and, and sort of diminished other dimensions of higher education. So when we, nowadays we complain that too much of the debates of higher education are too much, all the emphasis are on the economic effects and the economic motivations and the economic benefits, it's because of that. And, and I think, well, it's, in a sense, it, 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 you can't have it both. You cannot, I think it's very difficult to, to have an argument that on the one hand you say that ed higher education is important because of its contribution to economic growth and development and to employability and so on, and then try to insulate the system from this kind of economic rationality. And that's, I think, um, and that's why at that time in the 1960s and 1970s, many non-economists re responded to this as a sort of, as a kind of uh, Faustian pact that, that higher education and education in general was selling the soul to the devil and that, that would cost highly afterwards. But at the same time, and, uh, and this is, I'm, I'm, this is basically my speculation, I don't think it would have been possible to expand higher education up to the point that we did if we wouldn't have this kind of argument. I think it would have been much more difficult to sell to society to spend so much more money as we did over the last 30, 40 years in higher education if we haven't convinced policymakers and um, society that this was very advantageous from an economic point of view. I don't think. I think higher education would have stayed in many ways as a sort of as much more elitist and much more restricted access than it became. But um, but yes, it has implications, and and the implication is that the economic the, the contemporary debate about higher education nowadays plays so much emphasis in terms of um, you know the, what are the economic effects, what are the benefits of um, what are the implications of higher education, um, why do people go into higher education? You know, a lot of the debates about the students and the students as a as a customer as this dimension about what they want it's because and there is this. Um, a wonderful expression that some um, um, economists have, have christened that the, the 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 adolescent or the teenager as a as a, an econometrician. So the idea that actually we believe that uh, teenagers are capable of anticipating what will be their returns, and therefore they will choose the the type of degree and the institution that will maximize their benefits, their income in twenty years, thirty years, forty years. Which is, a, which is a tricky thing, but that's in in many ways that's that's the underlying rationale, and also the the way uh, we use the resources. So all the debate about um, the ways of funding higher education, I think, has increasingly been dominated by uh, economic arguments and economic um, um, uh, and economic analysis, and and part of that is is because uh, in a sense the, the 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 picture favors that. I mean, these are the kind of data that you that you are familiar with. One of them is because um, society and individuals are convinced that having a higher degree, having a university degree, is an advantage in the labor market. Still, regardless of all the variability and all the, there are several issues at stake, but you know, this is the, the black line is what will be the, the level of earnings if you have, um, um, up and secondary and post-secondary non-tertiary education. This is if you only have below upper secondary education, only basic education, sort of nine years. And this is if you have tertiary education. And, um, you know, in some countries like Brazil, Hungary, Slovenia, Czech and Slovak republics, um, the US, uh, Portugal, Ireland, um, Poland, really there, even sort of... Um, more or less egalitarian, egalitarian society like Germany, to have a university degree is, is a significant advantage in terms of their earnings. And that's been something that has been consistently shown by um, 
for all countries. Some in some of them actually the difference. I mean, unsurprisingly, for Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Belgium, by the way, uh, the difference is less significant. So of course, if the the earnings uh, distribution is more uh, compressed, then the, the advantage of having an university degree is less significant. But but still, it exists. And um, and at the same time, actually, you have that advantage advantage also for those that have you know upper secondary education compared to those that have less than that. So this this consistent advantage of having more education means an advantage in terms of earnings. That's that has been very robust and that has been, I think, very powerful in terms of uh, policy arguments. And the same thing in terms of unemployment rates. And um, and I I actually like this um, this um, graph because well. We, we have had all the discussions about the impact of the recession in terms of unemployment. There's been quite a lot of concern in many European countries about the impact of the recession in terms of rising unemployment of university graduates. And that's clearly the case for a couple of countries like Estonia, Spain, Ireland, Greece, unsurprisingly some of the countries that have been mostly be most badly affected by the uh, recession. But actually, in several other European and uh, Western countries, the impact of the recession in terms of unemployment of uh, university graduates has been actually very, very small. And, and I think that's particularly interesting because when you compare to those that are below upper secondary school, you see that, well, if you look at the scale here, um, I mean, some of the, in some of these countries, the, the rates of unemployment are already, for people that are below upper secondary education, um, already close to 40%. And if I put again this here, you, the maximum that you get, even in countries like Spain, which has a very, very high level of unemployment, it, it has increased to 10%. Okay, But if you look here, the case of Spain, which is the second one, yeah, I think sure, it's getting close to 30%. Actually, they are already overtaking this because this, uh, these are the, uh, the latest data that the education at the glance had last year, but, but I suspect that um, it is clearly, well, I know that this has already been um, beyond this, but, so it's in many ways, the ratio, the ratio between the levels of unemployment for um, people that have less than secondary education, for people that have high education, can be easily three, four times. And of course, the, it makes much more to the news nowadays if you have graduates unemployed, it's the classical story of the, the man that bites the dog, not the dog that bites the man. Uh, but it, it, it clearly shows, I think, again, this is something that is very, very much embedded into our views about higher education. So the idea that higher education basically serves as a shelter or as a, a sort of protection in terms of unemployment and in terms of enhancing your earnings. So all the, the, the arguments nowadays have been increasingly contaminated by this. The other thing that you also know it's the idea that increasingly our economic structure is asking for more and more qualification. And you know that there's been, those of you that um, know this, know that the, the arguments about the so-called so knowledge economy is actually much more complicated than the, the sort of the simple explanation. Um, but in any case, and there are very, very few problems, those of you that are familiar with uh, labor markets, know that these kind of classifications have uh, problems. But the basic trend is that clearly um, it's, it's been represented by what a lot of economists call the skill bias technology uh, trend. So the idea that technological development will ask for more skilled labor. So those that are more skilled will be more in a more advantageous situation than those that are skilled. And that for you, you have an emphasis and those of, that are more skilled will, in a sense, be better off in terms of earnings. Those, uh, those that are low-skilled will tend to be much more vulnerable to technological change. And that's by looking at uh, um, um, labor, the employment structure, or the labor structure in terms of uh, two quite different countries in many ways, the UK and the US, but um, which are, we've been at the forefront of a lot of these economic transformations. You see that although the transformations are not massive in terms of uh, 30 years, Still, you clearly see a trend towards that. It's there is some changes in the employment structure that tends to play along those lines, and there's quite a lot of debate in economics about that. And that idea, regardless of what you think, 
that, that idea at all in terms of the political debate. So politicians like the idea of the knowledge economy, and there's no, almost no single nowadays political manifesto that doesn't bring the education and the higher education, in particular in the science, um, linked to economics and, and economic growth and economic competitiveness. And well, if you remember the, uh, to me, some of the classical examples, remember that when Tony Blair or Bill Clinton became um, prime minister and, and president, they said, well, uh, we have three priorities, education, education, education. And I don't think it's because they were, well, this is being taped, but um, none of them were particularly impressive as intellectuals, so it's not really that they were so concerned with the role of education as enhancing people's cultural and intellectual capabilities. It's basically this kind of argument that they are concerned with. And, and it's actually quite interesting, if I'm allowed a sort of just a sort of provocation. Um, is that interesting because although human capital was very much developed by people on the right, I mean, both Becker and, and Schultz were clearly um, uh, aligned with the Republican Party. Um, and now these arguments about um, you know, human capital and investment education being so much taken over by the left and that social democratic parties and, and socialist parties and, and so on have been so much concerned with, with the idea. And actually it has become in many ways a dividing line between the right and the left, certainly in Europe, that the left wants to invest more in education and science and, and makes that an argument, because in many ways saw an opportunity to keep an influence of public policies in, in the market economy. And, and the right actually doesn't feel so much comfortable necessarily with that. And that's actually quite, quite an interesting in terms of how ideas travel politically, but that, that was the provocation and I will shut up. Um, so you have a context in which because of these trends towards back and forth in terms of the, mar the role of market forces, competition private and private versus government in education as sway back towards the, sort of the market side. And at the same time, because of these human capital ideas and the economic arguments about the, the benefits of higher education, um, I think this has, has been tremendously important in changing the debates about how should we, what is higher education, what is the purpose of higher education, and therefore why and how should we pay for higher education. And I think the main difference is in separating three dimensions um, that economists tend to emphasize and that's normally the end of the friendship with most non-economists because we like to um, uh, separate three things that for us make sense as different things and, and that explains why we say that it's difficult to understand higher education as a public good. Because for us, we need to separate the nature of higher education, the funding of higher education, and provision of higher education. For most uh, social scientists and for most sort of uh, non-economists, basically this is the same thing. And, and in many ways, when people say higher education is a public good because it's publicly provided and publicly funded. So when economists talk about the public good, they talk about actually the first question, not the second and the third. They talk about the idea that is there something specific in terms of that good that makes that less viable to be provided by a market solution, by private provision? So is there a case that, well, um, if we leave this to individual decision-making and to um, private um, provision, then we would, we would have problems. We would have problems in terms of the quantity or the quality of the good to be provided. And that's, that's uh, I mean, concern, and, and this is normally associated with a definition that is being developed by another very influential, very important economist of the second half of the 20th century, Paul Samuelson, uh, by definition of public good, that you find in all textbooks in economics and in public economics and microeconomics. And it's normally related to characteristics. This is from the 1950s, 1952, 53. Um, and it's the idea of non-exclusion non and non revolt The idea that, well, can I exclude people from getting access to this? If I can't, or if it's too complicated for me to exclude them, it means that 
there can be a situation where they will free write. So they will get access to the to the benefits without paying for it. And if that's the case, the private provider will not have an incentive to do this. Um, the second thing is in terms again of non revolving. So is is a situation that if I'm providing something that the, even if some of you are consuming, the amount that is available for the rest doesn't suffer, that is not affected by the amount of people that consume. Okay? And, you know, the classical examples would be um, um, lightning, in terms of the lighthouses, would be the classical example. So, or security in a street. So if my neighbors pay for it, it means that my street will be safe and I don't have to pay for it unless I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm forced to. Um, another example that some of my neighbors normally mention is, um, I don't know if you have this situation that your condo has uh, some share costs and everyone is supposed to contribute on an annual basis. And if someone stops contributing, unless you take them to court, of course the lift will continue op operating, the cleaners will come and someone pay for them. So everything will be taken care of, but they will not contribute. And unless you start a fight with your neighbor, the, the ones that don't pay, you you have a, 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 so they will benefit from the, the cleaning and the gardening and the lifts and the lightning and so on, and they will not pay for it. Of course, they have a legal commitment, and then you can sort it out. But it's it's clearly one of those examples where people will continue to create right. And so whenever you have this kind of, any of these two situations, Private providers will have a much weaker incentive to get into that market. Or they will, in many cases, provide a quantity that is insufficient for what you would consider would be desirable, okay, in terms of a market working factor. And in the case of, um, of higher education, or actually in the case of education in general, actually a lot of economists have introduced a sort of a nuance which is calling, well, in a sense, this is neither exactly a a public good because it doesn't fulfill this criteria but it's not purely a, a private good because we as a society we also benefit well remember all this discussion about you know economic competitiveness and there will be also other things that have been explored well, there have been some studies um, trying to see the, the impact in terms of health or in terms of crime or in terms of political behavior by the fact that people are more educated so there are social benefits associated with that. So all of us as a society, or even from an economic point of view, the fact that even in higher education there have been studies about peer effects, the fact that you, as a student, you're part of a team or part of a group of good students, that will normally encourage you and make you uh, uh, enhance your uh, learning, at the same time that you are in the middle of a not very bright group of students normally, or sort of very lazy one, that will normally negatively affect you. So, some of these um, uh, externalities also have uh, their social advantages in having more education. And therefore, we, we, in a sense, higher education becomes a sort of an intermediate category, what we would call a merit good. And that underlying this idea is the idea that, well, on the one hand, higher education is basically a private good, and therefore should be largely funded by private money. But there is some social benefits, some externalities that justify that some kind of public funding should exist. Okay? And there are other arguments related to the way higher education operates. The fact that the level of information that individuals have, the, the, the sort of half joke that I was making about adolescents knowing what will happen to them. So the fact that many people are, are deciding about should I, should I enroll in higher education or not, which type of institution, which type of program, means that a lot of them are dealing with imperfect information. And actually, one significant part of that imperfect information is that you don't know it until you try it. I mean, many of us, when we decided about our first degree or even about our PhD, it was very much a sort of an educated guess, because we are educated people. Uh, but it was really... Um, it's it's sort of it's the Forrest Gump thing that uh, it's like the chocolate box that you you need to open until you try it, otherwise you don't know it. It's it's very much the thing. So the fact that you need to experience, but actually, by experience that you may have you may change your mind, but that means that you already spent quite a lot of money and quite a lot of time. So you cannot keep on trying. So in order to minimize that risk, 
you need to subsidize actually, otherwise a lot of people would decide probably not to enroll into higher education because it was too risky, too uncertain for them. Okay? And that's why you have these kind of peculiarities of higher education institutions that they say, well, you need to have some public subsidies, otherwise, because it's too uncertain and too risky, because there are too many unknowns, then people most likely will not go into higher education. And if they don't go into higher education, you don't get all those economic advantages that you, you are interested. Okay? So, but although, you know, most economists would accept that a significant part of the funding of higher education should go from, should come from public sources, they also increasingly will put an emphasis on private funding. And that's why, well, this is, this comes even more significantly because of the, the difficult context that many higher education systems face, the fact that you want more and more people to go into higher education. Uh, this not only costs more because you have more students, but the cost per student has been increasing. And this is the case, I think, particularly in the case of Europe, because of the emphasis on research universities. So, in universities, or if you see at the statements of the European University Association, the way they define, or if you see in most countries, the way they define universities, or the way they define education institutions, there is an implication that they will do at least some research. And that means that the staff will have to teach fewer hours, and they will have to be more qualified, and so on and so forth. Of course, you, you can make arguments that because your staff does more research, the quality of your education is better, but still it means that it's more costly. Okay? And it's also the expectations of people also that the quality of the labs, the quality of the teaching rooms, the quality of the cafeterias will be better and more expensive and the dorms and the sports facilities and so on and so forth. There's quite a lot of literature in the US um, because there the tuition has been following, the cost of tuition has been following this and therefore it's much more controversial. In our case, in the European case, it doesn't follow so much but it follows on the side of the budgets and that, that's been a significant issue of concern. And because there is a growing restrictions on public expenditure. Some of them are very much sort of short-term related to the recession that we are dealing with, but a lot of them are structural. And, and part of the problem is particularly um, those of you that are more familiar with funding issues in higher education know that higher education is facing an uphill battle. The fact that we are competing with two big uh, portions of the public budgets, which are healthcare and social security, and the structure of Western societies is in their favor. So we are becoming more and more older. Uh, we are becoming aging societies. That means that the costs in terms of health care, in terms of pensions, are growing. That means that we will lose that battle, I'm afraid. So even if you can keep the level of public expenditure as it is, which is questionable in many countries for various reasons, um, not only economic, in some ways political, uh, even if you can keep there will be a growing pressure for redistribution of um, uh, money from education in general, and even education in science, to, um, to healthcare and to um, social security. And actually, that's why some people, some economists will say, unless you make an economic argument, unless you say that this is very good for your growth and competition, so please don't take away part of that money, it will be very difficult. So you do make this only on the grounds of cultural, social, egalitarian purposes, um, I think it will be much more difficult to be kept. So, a lot of the, with this context, a lot of the debate is how much do we get, where should we put the, the money that is very scarce, and this puts much more the sort of the, the, the arguments in, it frames the arguments in terms of uh, economic arguments. So, the way I read many of these developments that you're familiar with, the emphasis on performance-based funding, on revenue diversification, on cost-sharing. This all has to do with an intellectual um, background, a political background, that looks at higher education increasingly from an economic perspective. I mean, the, the performance-based funding is one of the most obvious. So if you want to, um, to look at higher education increasingly from an economic perspective, you want to treat increasingly universities as sort of quasi-economic organizations and you want to test their performance, you want to see how well do they do in terms of using their resources. And you want to reward 
the most effective, the most efficient, and you want to publish the others. And which is very much the logic that you have in a, in a market. In terms of revenue justification and cost sharing, I think it's also um, more or less obvious the connection, the idea that those who benefit both the students, but also society, companies and so on, they need to contribute more because they benefit from the outputs of higher education and not necessarily always to go through the public budgets. And um, the idea of loans is, of course, associated with the, the rising tuition fees, is the idea that, well, okay, now you are constrained in terms of your uh, budget capabilities because you are a student, but in the future, remember that nice graph with the advantage of earnings in terms of um, tertiary education graduates, in the future you can repay. So that's all of that is again and again on the basis of this is an economic transaction, you, you, you have future benefits, so now we'll lend you money and you'll pay back when you have more money. So, and that's, um, the, the voucher system is also, I think, it's, it's very much a, an inheritance of Friedman's influence, actually Friedman is the one that revived it. It's not an original creation of Friedman, uh, but it's, it's very much the one associated with him. It's the idea that even if you have public funding, it doesn't mean that should be provided, education should be provided by public institutions. Because you want to have competition, and by having competition you have a more efficient and more responsive uh, higher education system. It's actually quite interesting that a lot of the experiment, you don't really have an experiment so far of a voucher at the higher education level. You have at the low level of education, which in many ways it's counterintuitive. Because you would say, well, a voucher system is, makes more sense when you're dealing with adults <coughs> that have the capability to decide. And in fact, for me, it's, 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 it's really a puzzle why so far governments haven't experimented this with higher education and they have done it with, with kindergartens and basic education. The other dimension where I think the prioritization has been advanced in terms of Europe is... Um, although probably the less significant, I will talk about three. I will talk about funding, I will talk about private provision, and I will talk about the privatization of public institutions. And the one, um, this I, I think is actually the, in some ways the less significant for Western Europe, because our concept of Europe has changed over the last 20 years. Um, I think that also our perceptions have changed. Um, because actually when you look at I don't know how well you can see this. Uh, okay. Um, this is actually from a study that um, some of you may know, the Yomida study that was done um, a few years ago. And now we, we're just starting a, a, a new phase of updating this, but we don't have yet the, the, the new data. But, but it hasn't changed a lot um, since then. So this is roughly five years old. Um, and actually, when we look at um, 27, 27 new members at that time, plus Norway and Switzerland, so this is pre-referendum in Switzerland, but you're still allowed to use Switzerland. Um, and it's very interesting because actually, the, in some of you have quite a contrast here. Basically, you have a lot of Western Europe. Uh, the public provision of uh, higher education is overwhelming dominant. And this means 99, sometimes 100 percent. And then you have um, several countries in Eastern Europe, um, and Portugal as the sort of the odd one, Spain a little bit, and Italy, but not so much, where you have visible private sectors. And 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 this is definition of public and private is always a source of uh, debate. This means that when you, it's it's ownership and it's um, funding together. So, and, and why you need to put these two together? Because, for instance, in the UK, most of the institutions are not public in the way they are understood in continental Europe, because they are not owned by the state. They are, in many ways, really more sort of charities. But they were, until two years ago, now that it's a more mixed situation, they were largely funded as public institutions. Um, so the, the ones that we have here are the ones that are not only private um, bodies, private organizations that are not sort of part of the public sector, 
but they also it means that their students will pay full cost fees. Okay, and that means that in some cases you're talking about this is a small um, case of uh, Cyprus as a sort of a, a really a, a, a peculiar situation, but you have quite a few cases where 25, 30 percent of the students are enrolled, and this is a very different picture from what you have in Germany, in France, in UK, um, in the Netherlands, where basically these type of institutions are, are marginal to the higher education landscape. Okay. And that's, and that actually, Europe in many ways is still sort of the bastion of this kind of picture, because whenever you go outside of Europe, then in many ways is the, the, the table would, would, would shift sides. So if you look at, in terms of Latin America, if you look in terms of um, um, Asia and so on and so forth, actually, in many countries, the majority of the students are enrolled in full cost um, uh, private institutions. And that, that changes very much the dynamics. And actually, a lot of these discussions are, in many ways, much more difficult to have with um, Brazilians and the Argentinians and the Mexicans, because in some cases, there is a constitutional ban for tuition fees in the public sector. And then you have 75%, 80% of the students paying full cost fees in the private sector. Apparently, the constitution does not apply here. Um, so, and it's which questions many of our assumptions about um, higher education and public higher education as a way of creating opportunities for people. Because, in actually, in many of these cases, in many of those cases outside Europe, public higher education is a very strong mechanism of reproducing elites because the ones that will get into the public elite institutions are the ones that come from well-off families, which will be public subsidized heavily by everyone else, okay. which is the kind of argument that makes a lot of my colleague economists getting uh, very nervous. Um, so it becomes actually a very regressive uh, mechanism and not a very progressive mechanism. Um, but, it, but you see, despite in terms of West, sort of Western Europe, Private education is not very significant. Part of the problem that they are not so much on the radar screen is that even when they are significant in terms of enrollment, this is uh, when we try to classify the um, institutions in the, this project. We tried to classify, there was a large data set that tried to cover as many institutions as possible in Europe. And then there was a restricted data set for what we consider to be research active institutions. And you see that you know, in, for many of these countries, well, in some cases, Portugal would be a terrible example in this respect, there are very few, if at all, any institution in the private sector that we can consider as research active institutions. Okay. There are problems with this classification, some of the problems that, you know, some of the, not necessarily all the countries I think have used, have operationalized the definition the same way, so that I wouldn't compare so much. But But the general trend is that even for countries where the private sector has some significance, they normally are not very visible uh, in terms of higher education research because they don't do a lot of research. So they, we look down on them because of our definition of a proper institution should do research, and most of them don't do any. And this would be, even if they do a little bit of research, it's not that they are research-intensive institutions, that having PhD degrees, having some research grants, that would be sufficient to be qualified as research active, even having a mandate in terms of their mission statement. So to, to know that 100% or 90-something percent of those private institutions don't even qualify on any of these criteria tells you something about, about them and, 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 and raises a lot of issues about their legitimacy, their legitimacy in terms of the education community, in terms of the system, um, in terms of policy, um, and so on and so forth. The other thing that, that is also interesting is that they're also less visible because they tend to be very specialized. Most of them are very small institutions. So this is the distribution of, um, of public institutions in terms of um, the several fields where you would consider so the several, you know, the, the set eight fields that you would have for you know, science, humanities, um, social science, and so on and so forth. And for most of the 29 countries, actually, the... Um, most institutions will cover a big number of, um, of fields, if not all of them. Okay, so they, the public sector tends to be sort of very um, 
tend to cover all the areas. And this is the picture for the private one. So most of the private, and that's actually a pattern that you find in most um, uh, countries where you have a significant private sector. Even when they enroll the majority of the students, they tend to be very much focused on the very, um, um, they tend to be on average smaller than the public institutions and much more specialized than public institutions. And they tend to be focused on, normally, as you would be surprised, we don't have, there's no point in going into much detail actually, but um, the, the general pattern is that they tend to focus on social sciences, sometimes on um, computer sciences. So they tend to focus either on cheap degrees that require low investment, and they tend to focus also on degrees that have high demand, so they are safe in terms of uh, an investment. Why do I think it, this is significant in terms of our debate about public private or publicness, privateness of higher education? Because I think there is a significant concern here. The more we emphasize private-like behavior in the public sector, the more likely, I think, some of the public institutions, especially the less strong ones, will tend to behave as the private ones. They will tend to be... Uh, one of the things that we see when we compare behavior and patterns of specialization between public and private sectors in Europe and outside Europe is that the private institutions tend to be much more risk-averse. Because, of course, if they make mistakes, they will pay for those mistakes. Public institutions have a tradition of running much more greater risks because they know if something goes terribly wrong financially, they can put some pressure and they can get some money. It's becoming less and less the case, but they can still have some leverage in terms of getting extra funding if there's sort of very expensive decision or very expensive program that was not as successful. The more we emphasize a logic of competition in the public sector, the more I think they will tend to behave as the private ones. So I think in some ways, that's why it's interesting to look at the private, privately funded higher education sector, because I think it's much more resembling of what can be part of the public sector in the near future if we go along the, this road of uh, growing part of funding coming from private sources, growing and uh, differentiation in terms of funding. The final part that I wanted to make in this, um, I think I'm speaking too long for too long, is the privatization of the public institution. And actually, when we talk about privatization in um, higher education, actually, I think that's actually the largest part of the privatization has been taking part in the privateness of public institutions rather than the development of the private sector or the transfer of ownership of pr public institutions to the private sphere. In the, in the basic and secondary education, there have been some experiments of that, of governments actually giving chunks of the school districts to, to be privately run. You really don't have that experience in, in most systems in higher education. And, um, and this is a story that you already know, so I don't, I think in many cases, I don't need to go into much into detail. But I think actually this has been one of, this links to a lot of the things that I've been talking about. Uh, this afternoon about the economic rationalization of higher education, the, l the idea that we should emphasize the market regulation of higher education, that means that public higher education institutions should behave increasingly as um, and be adapt their governance structure, adapt their management and their decision-making processes to sort of public uh, logic. And this, I mean, there's several... There's a lot here that we don't have time to go into detail, but one of them, for instance, is in terms of the human resource management. The fact that in many countries, 30, 40 years ago, the academic and the non-academic staff were civil servants. In many cases, they are not anymore. They've been increasingly transferred, and nowadays they are, they are um, employees of the institution, not employees of the state. And that, I think, is actually very significant in many ways, and some of them not always perceived as, as obviously. One of them is the more and more we became employees of one institution, the less significant are the sense of belonging to a certain class. And the, I think the less significant becomes the idea of a system, as we used to have 20, 30 years ago in, in Europe, that all institutions were more or less similar. 
because the pay scale, the working conditions, um, the, the, the curriculum, the programs and so on, they were more or less similar. And a lot of these trends towards, for instance, adaptation, responsiveness to the local needs meant differentiation in terms of education, in terms of research profile and so on and so forth. But the organizational changes have also been significant and that meant that increasingly you have individual relations, institutional differentiation also in, in relation to um, human resources management. And increasingly means that you may have some of these public institutions are foundations, some of them will be able to pay more, some of them will get more money because they are more successful in terms of revenue education, it means that they can pay more to the attract the best staff. And this is creating a landscape of growing differentiation and growing competition between these institutions. And the erosion of sense of collectiveness in most systems, I think, is also linked to this idea that they are basically economic organizations or quasi-economic organizations competing increasingly with each other. So they are not part of a same state public structure that used to be the case. And that I think has changed. There, there are many other things that I, uh, we, we could explore, I, I don't have time, but I'll just emphasize one of them is actually the, the, the participation of external members in governance decision making. I think it's also significant. I think it's also changing um, the logic we will within many um, universities and many higher education institutions. And the fact that they are now internally present, I think, is changing the, the, the type of discussions that you have inside institutions. It means that we're not anymore as professors, for instance, as students say that this is just between us and we decide because it's not anymore. And, I mean, think about the, the changes in, in many countries where um, actually external members now play a very significant role. Um, and, well, the, the erosion of collegialism in the decision-making process and so on and so forth. And many, I think, many of these uh, changes are still very at the beginning, but I think all of them uh, will contribute to the erosion of this sense of collectiveness and uh, a growing emphasis on each institution will be concerned with their own interests and with their own uh, situation. So, um, I mean, I, I don't think there's much I, I should add in terms, especially because if you want to have some time for questions, but um, but I think the tale that I've been trying to uh, um, tell here is one of the declining publicness and, and growing privateness. And I think this has happened both in the way that higher education has been conceived at the system level, and all the debates about marketization, privatization are significant, but also because what we and you as individuals and what society expects from higher education has changed. And the growing emphasis on higher education as something that has economic relevance, I think has been transforming and changing significantly the way education institutions operate. And that's why um, 20 years ago only a few economists were there to say that higher education is not a public good. Nowadays, increasingly, you have this kind of debate about um, that, well, even if it's publicly provided, even if it's still a large part funded by public sources. Um, there are growing arguments about how public is higher education. And, uh, and I think that's... It means that there will be a lot of material for us as higher education researchers in the future, but I think it certainly means that the future will be much more complex for those operating in higher education. I hope that I haven't finished in a very dismal tone, but you know that economists are known for being the dismal science. So... Um, sorry for having taken a bit longer than planned. Thank you very much. Thank you.